It's likely because we're chronically tired, we're activating in a sustained way the stress axis. And that's going to push up blood pressure. It's going to throw glucose into the circulation. So it pre then disposes to things like obesity, type 2 diabetes. And indeed, because of the suppression of the immune system, higher rates of infection and indeed um, cancer. Some very convincing studies showing that night shift work, for example, uh, night shift nurses have higher rates of colorectal cancer and breast cancer. In fact, those data are now so good that the World Health Organization has listed night shift work as a probable carcinogen. So, so I, I think the really key point is that chronic sleep loss is so much more than feeling, feeling tired at an inappropriate time. It's associated with an impact upon our health at every level. Yeah, I mean, what you just went through there, it, it, it impacts negatively our, our day-to-day -day lives. You mentioned empathy. I mean, what do we need for good quality relationships yeah. with partners, children, work colleagues, family? We need empathy. Yeah, and, 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 and or invariably in the workplace, you need creativity. You need people to be able to work together. You want to reduce irritability. You need often yeah. a good sense of humour. And so really, we should be really promoting good sleep to Im improve productivity. Yeah, it speaks to something you said earlier on in our conversation that when we are sleep deprived, we forget all the positive experiences and remember the negative ones, yeah. which of course completely alters your view and perception of the world. It yeah. feels like this dark, scary place rather yeah. than an uplifting, hopeful, joyful place. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, yes, these short-term consequences, but also these pretty scary long-term consequences. Now, yeah. one thing I really appreciate about the messages you try and put out there into the public is you, you really seem to be trying to help promote health without scaring people. Yep. Now, of course, these statistics are scary. And there's two groups of people I want to keep at the forefront of our mind now as we think about these negative side effects. We mentioned shift work, and I want to talk about shift work because what I read in your book is that one in eight UK workers currently are shift workers. Yep. That's probably only going to increase. That's a lot of people. Yes. And I can't imagine what it's like for a shift worker to just hear what you said the WHO say, which is yeah. a probable carcinogen. Yeah. That's not a nice thing to hear no. if you work shifts, if you're a, whatever, if you're a nurse looking after people to help their health and you think, yeah, but at the same time, I'm wrecking mine in the process. So shift work is something I want to talk about. But also the other thing I've noticed as I've been trying to raise awareness of sleep now in books and podcasts for maybe five years, unwittingly, we can often end up scaring people and making them feel worse and more anxious. Now, young parents often will get in touch and say, look, you know, uh, love, what you, love what you said. You know, I understand about sleep, but I'm really worried. Mm -hmm. My three-month-old doesn't sleep through the night, you know, or whatever is going on. So many parents get really scared when they hear this sort of stuff. So if we address parents first of all, Short-term sleep deprivation, long-term, is it okay for a few years of a parent sleep deprived? You know, help us sort of get less scared about that if you yeah, can. Yeah, well, I think there's two issues here. Um, one thing that, that our society, or the in the developed nations at least, uh, has shifted very rapidly from the extended family yeah. to the nuclear family, where the parents become the sole providers for their children. Um, and it's usually the mother. And uh, what's happened up until fairly recently is that childcare was a distributed activity. And so when the mum got tired, there was an aunt or a sister or a friend who would take over so that the mum can get some sleep. And if you look at the primate societies, uh, you see that uh, care is distributed across the group. We have never yeah. evolved to be the sole uh, parents, as it were, of, of our children. And I think the first point to make is that young mums in particular, but, 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 but both parents, uh, should not be afraid to reach out. And I think there's this sort of terrible guilt that I can't cope because I'm feeling tired. Well, no surprise. We never evolved to, to look after our children in this manner. So before babies are born, 
it's really important to think about the support network that you can put in place to to, to try and mitigate some of the, the chronic sleep loss. Now, what are the long-term consequences of this? It's It's not clear. Uh, I suspect that there are probably buffers that kick in that actually um, prevent some of the some of the damaging effects of, of chronic sleep loss during those sort of few months. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and in fact, I think it's a really important area of, of, of study. Yeah, I think, you know, what you said there, I think, is really helpful. First of all, just recognize that the way we're bringing kids up now is tough. Yeah. We never have to do it like this. You know, recently, Russell, my wife's father has been away in Kenya for a couple of months, see his yeah. family. And my mother-in-law has been staying with us on and off for a couple of months. Mm. And let me tell you the difference. It, you just, it's, it's little things, but just having a third adult in the house yes. when it comes to childcare, it, it, it's not just one more person. It seems to have changed everything. The whole dynamic the changes. The whole dynamic yeah. changed. Yeah. I, I was Absolutely. like, this is incredible. This is what humans have always done, yet yeah. many of us have moved away for work, for opportunity. We don't have those support systems. So I thought that hopefully takes the pressure off people to at least go, yes, I know it's hard, but yes, it is hard. It really is hard. You're mm. not you're not broken. It's not that you can't no. cope. No, none of us can cope with that. Yep. So I think that's a really nice message. But also that message, you can reach out, you know, yes. maybe you need to phone a friend and say, hey, listen, I'm knackered. Could I just have a nap? Could you come while I have a nap? And it's not a sign place? of weakness. Yeah. It's, it's actually, you know, em embracing our biology in a sense. Um, and and I, it's, it's tragic that I think that young parents don't know that um, and feel guilty about it. It's, it's simply wrong. And, it, and it's, you know, it's so many unintended consequences that we're facing at the moment and and sort of with increased wealth and independence you know we think right you know we don't have to live with our parents anymore or we can move a long way away from them and yet we've we've lost something in the process i mean i was you know my my i was my i very close to my grandparents who looked after me while my my mother was working and it was a as you as you say it was a mental you know a, a big thing so mummy's coming home and it was all you know excitement and yeah. and you have that dynamic environment um and clearly you know we are where we are but but people shouldn't be afraid to reach out i think that's so important let's talk about shift work um there's all kinds of things there's a huge section on shift work in the book which i think will be very helpful for anyone. We mentioned how many people, of course, are shift workers. Yeah. We mentioned the potential health problems of that. Yes. You know, something I read in your book, which I found fascinating, was that over 90% of night shift workers, was it even 97%? 97, yeah. They don't adapt. No. And, and so that's going back to light again. So you've got relatively dim light uh, within the workplace, within the office or the factory. And then, of course, on the journey home uh, or on the journey in, you're going to, or during the day, you're going to experience bright natural light. And the clock always defers to the brighter light signal as being daytime. So the assumption for, b b by employers... The clock, the clock always defers to the brighter light signal. I think that's a really yeah. powerful thing. And we that's why we with. don't shift. And in fact, there, there's one group, um, there's a lovely study from the University of Surrey, Josephine Rent, and what, you know that, that 3%, some of them are North Sea oil workers, wow. because what happens is they're out on the rig at night under these great arc lights, and then they're in windowless metal boxes during the day. And they do switch. And so they become nocturnal, as it were. Wow. Then, of course, it's really tough for them because then they have two weeks of shore leave and they're completely maladapted to their friends and family. But, the, the, you know, the serious issue is you, you, you don't adapt. And, and, and so I remember chatting to uh, the chairman of the CBI oh, many years ago now and, and, you know, giving a speech saying, we're going to cure the problems of British industry by running it on a 24-7 basis. No need to build lots of offices in London, you know, the rush hour, et cetera, et cetera. Deeply well-meaning individual. No idea of the biological consequences and the assumption that, that the clock will adapt to the demands of working at night. And for 97% of people, it doesn't. We're not machines, we're human nope. beings, right? Absolutely, yes. And uh, I think you could 
you could you but, could apply that across all kinds of different well, things in society. It, it is fascinating because we we are we've achieved so much. I mean, you know, it's we shouldn't. I mean, it's phenomenal what we've achieved as as a as a as a as a, as a species. Um, but we are. It comes with some some massive arrogance. And what we've assumed is that we can do whatever we like whenever we choose. And because we've invaded the night cheaply with electricity since the 1950s onwards, we've invaded the night and have thrown away that really important part of our biology, which is sleep. That's interesting. It was only in the 1950s when we've... Big acceleration. When we've yeah. really aggressively invaded yeah. the night. That's not long. No. Through an evolution lens, that's just a blink. Yeah, and, and clearly, you know, we've been creeping in. You know, yeah. The aristocrats were using candles. And in fact, a, a sign of wealth was you would eat later in the evening and you'd light your... But remember, a candle, you know, in the early 19th century was the equivalent of a, of a working man's daily wage. So only the rich yeah. could, could have light. And of course, why would you burn fat, which is what candles were made of, when this is food? And of course, food... Food was incredibly scarce for so many people, working people, 200 years, 150 years ago. We'll stay on shift work for the minute, but this doesn't just apply to shift work. Driving, driving yeah. tired, and a pretty alarming statistic in your book about what it means to drive at 4am for most people. Yeah, well, there's, well, well, Drew Dawson has done a wonderful study. Drew Dawson's based in, in Australia. And he compared the cognitive performance, the loss of one's ability to process information um, uh, across the day and found a very you know poor cognition around about four o'clock in the morning where, where it got to its lowest point. Um, and he compared that with the loss of cognitive ability with consuming sufficient alcohol to make you legally drunk. And on the scale, it was about a minus 15 um, dropping cognition when you were legally drunk. But at four o'clock in the morning, it was minus 20. So, so if, if listeners take nothing from, from this at all, other than the fact that if you're driving at four o'clock in the morning, your ability to process information is worse than if you were legally drunk. Okay, this, this is big, right? Because we've touched a few times on this this whole societal condition, what we're being asked to do now or what we think we have to do to fit in with society versus yes. what's biologically optimal. Some people, of course, have to get up early for work. Yeah. Some people now drive through the night. Yes. Lorry drivers, you know, big, yep. big cargo in the back. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm sure they've got certain regulations, certain things that they do in order to be less tired yes. uh, at that time. But, you know, driving at 4 a.m., Yeah for most of us being worse than when we might be legally drunk. That's pretty alarming. It's extraordinary. And uh, because also then let's think about, look, I'm, I don't really do this anymore. But if I think about my social culture in my 20s and 30s, you know, you go to a mate's wedding, mm. right? There'll be some late nights, a few drinks. And then you drive home on the Sunday, you know, mm. yeah, you're, you're, you know, uh, just to be super clear, you know, you, you, you're fully sober, yes. you know, but, Culturally, it's okay. Oh, yeah, I'm knackered. I've just got to drive now for four hours. Yeah. But we're putting people's lives at risk, we not are, just our own. We're, we're, we're putting yeah. other people's lives at risk. So, so culturally, yeah. this idea of driving when tired, I think is something we all need to face. Well, I think it's like smoking. We're not only um, endangering our own health, but um, the collateral damage is that we're harming uh, other people. But people who will are, do this. Uh, yes. And uh, I think it's, again, it's, it's a matter of education and, and a failure to appreciate. Um, you, you know, junior doctors, a study published fairly recently showed that 57% had either had a crash or a near miss on the drive after the night shift. Uh, so, so now again, we're, we're going into scary territory, but the key point is there's stuff we can do about it. We're not going to put the 24-7 society, mm. you know, genie back in its bottle. So what can we do to mitigate yeah. some of these problems? Well, knowing that we're going to be vulnerable to having a crash on the drive home, then we, sh or, or employers, and I think there's a serious duty of care yeah. here, is they should make available or subsidise the use of devices you can put on the dashboard that measure head nod or the fact that the car is veering and alert you to that and and, and that you know an alarm goes off and make sure you you know you're woken up and of course many high end German cars ha now have this technology they, really? built built in yeah um, but that's something that that, that that could be done knowing that 
um, night shift workers have higher rates of cancer, coronary heart disease, diabetes 2, etc., etc. Why don't we institute uh, higher frequency health checks? You know, every six months for these individuals to catch these conditions before they come mm. become chronic. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. You just want to shock the system, then your body gets to reset. Um, and, and one of the, the most popular things to do in the longevity world now is 